Good morning. Nice to see you. Well, new venue, what do you think? It's going to work okay? Yeah? I think so. There's room right in the front row here. You know. So here you are. <laughs> I see. <laughs> it's a, a perfectly Presbyterian. You see, the front row is empty. Just, uh, we should just put cardboard chairs up here, just their props, you know. No one would ever use them. So, uh, oh, here we are. Thank you, Margo. Very good. <laughs> well, my friends, it is a delight to see you. I have been, you have no idea the anxiety I've been going through all summer, imagining walking into the gym and nobody's here. You know, I just figured, <laughs> you know, so you got yours as an answer this to prayer. I <laughs> see. Okay. Uh, is, the, is the amplifying, is that too hot? Is it too loud? Or is, that, is it okay? All right. I can't really tell from here, but I, I probably don't even need it at all, but, but um, we need to uh, use the mic to tape the uh, lecture, so that's why it's there. Anyway, uh, welcome. This is, as I think you all know, a series that we're starting on the Gospel according to St. Luke. And uh, the Luke is in the Bible, and uh, let's see all those Bibles out there. Huh? Oh, there's a few. Here's the problem. We are not in the sanctuary, and we don't have those wonderful pew Bibles that I can just tell you to grab the pew Bible, you know. So uh, you're going to have to make like this is actually Sunday school now. And uh, remember to either bring your Bibles, which I would deeply appreciate it if you would do that. Uh, you have no idea what, from my point of view, psychologically, it gives me such a sense of security when you are out there with Bibles, you know. Uh, so I just, I want you to be able to see that I'm not making this up. You know what I'm saying? So I want you to be able to see the words, and you can only do that if you have the text in front of you. So, uh, either bring your own Bible from home, which would be great, or I bet if you got here a couple of minutes early, you could sneak through the sanctuary and grab one of the pew Bibles and then return it when you go to the second service, huh? So, wouldn't that uh, uh, work okay? Don't tell anybody I said that. That's probably against uh, a thousand rules around here, but anyway, uh, if you can find your way clear to be in class with the Bible, that would be uh, wonderful. And we'll be picking up in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, in just uh, a minute or two. Just a couple of preliminary uh, comments. Uh, I've, I've mentioned this last year, I think some of you may recall. I've studiously avoided uh, teaching any of the uh, synoptic gospels of the Gospel of John ever since I've been at First Press. I joined First Presbyterian in 1980, so I'm coming up on 30 years, and for about 26 of those years I've been teaching in the adult education program, and I've taught Old Testament and New Testament, Paul's letters, Revelation, everything except the Gospels. And the reason is because I've been intimidated. And the reason I've been intimidated is because when I first joined this church, as some of you will recall, uh, Dale Bruner was here teaching of course, he owns the Gospels. You understand that. He owns them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and even John. And he's written one of the best-known commentators on Matthew, comment uh, commentaries on Matthew that's out there, and you frequently hear it alluded to. And so I think I've always felt that I'm in this long shadow, you know, of Dale Bruner, and you just dare not uh, enter where uh, he has already staked out his claim. But now... Uh, Dale's been gone for a while, and bless his heart, he's still working hard and doing a lot of good stuff, but I'm going to gird up the loins, you know, and plow in, so uh, uh, we'll hope for the best. I, and actually, this summer, as I've been doing some uh, preliminary research and study and preparation for this, I've just thought, <laughs> I've thought concerning Luke, you know, where have you been all my life? Now I'm, I'm really excited to uh, be doing this, and, and it's been just a wonderful uh, experience personally to be focused in on the synoptics in general and Luke in particular. So uh, that's what we're going to be about. Um, I expect that we'll probably take a couple of years to make it through Luke. I remember Roger Morlang made the comment once, Luke is really long-winded. <laughs> 
you know. Roger Morling, you know him. He's a prof out at Whitworth, a New Testament prof. And that's really true. He is kind of long-winded, but we're glad he's long-winded because he gives us all this additional color and texture, uh, unique information that we don't have anywhere else. But it does mean if we tried to hustle through Luke in one year, uh, it would be kind of a scamper, and I think it would, do un it would be unjust, really, to the text. So my plan is to spend a couple of years going at a reasonable pace uh, through Luke, and hopefully that'll work out all right. So, uh, if you have a Bible or can look on with someone, we're going to be picking up at uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 1, and only this morning make it through the first short paragraph. You know, I'm already behind. That's, uh, here we are. So, uh, um, but I am going to use the excuse of uh, taking a little less time in the text itself to do some background material. I just have this compulsive need to do this, so please just endure it this morning, a little bit about the authorship and the date and that kind of thing, and hopefully uh, that'll all get us on the same page as we get started. The next week we'll begin in earnest uh, with the birth narrative. So uh, this morning we'll start at chapter 1, verse 1, uh, down to verse 4. This is the Word of God. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. So there is our text for the morning. Let's uh, ask God's blessing on our reflection on it. Father, we're grateful that you give us out of your rich and wonderful bounty and grace this remarkable treasure that we call your word, this written record of the life of Christ and of the events surrounding the birth of your church. And we pray that this morning now as we turn our attention to this introduction to Luke and some of the other material related to this gospel that you would give us clarity and insight and appreciation for those things that have been discovered about it. We give you thanks for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, you're aware, first of all, that Luke is part of a two-volume uh, set in the New Testament. So we have Luke and we have Acts, and many times you'll see in literature it's simply referred to as Luke-Acts, as if it were referring to one work in two volumes. Uh, virtually nobody questions that the same person wrote both volumes. And so we are now dealing with volume one of that two-volume series. We uh, looked at Acts a few years ago, so I kind of took them out of order. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we're coming now to Luke. And Luke, of course, begins uh, the Gospel of Luke and also the book of Acts with a similar kind of dedicatory uh, preface to somebody whose identity we don't know, whose name is Theophilus. Uh, we have some guesses about who this character is, and I'll talk about those a little bit later, but right now we simply uh, note that this is, of course, who he's addressing as he writes this uh, work. So, Luke and Acts, uh, two volumes, one work. If you take the two together, you're dealing with about one-fourth of the New Testament. Luke writes more than any other single author in terms of the quantity of material in your New Testament, which is remarkable for a couple of reasons. First of all, because I don't think most people would think that if they, you know, just you asked them who wrote most of the New Testament. Uh, people might say Paul, you know, or something, but uh, uh, Luke is the one. It's remarkable because Luke is presumably, apparently, a Gentile. All the rest of the New Testament was written by Jewish authors, as we would expect, but Luke, as a Gentile, writes more quantitatively than anybody else in the uh, New Testament. So that's interesting that we who are, I think, for the most part, Gentiles here, have this character who's there in the New Testament who's responsible for so much of the uh, content of that uh, uh, document that we take so seriously. Uh, something a little bit more interesting, maybe interpretively, if you take these two volumes, you take Luke and Acts, and think of them as one great work, uh, 
there's an interesting kind of internal organization to them that has been noted by some commentators, and that is that they seem to be arranged as what's called a literary chiasm, C-H-I. It just dawned on me, look at this. <laughs> you know? It just, you know, sometimes, sometimes you notice things subliminally, and then all of a sudden, dong, I've got a black, I've got a, what do we call this, a whiteboard? So here's the word. A chiasm. Now, that's not a word we necessarily use in everyday, you know, casual conversation, but does anybody know what a chiasm is? Is that, uh, is that a brand new term? Anybody? You know what it is? Uh, yeah, and, uh, a chiasm is a, is a literary uh, a way of organizing material such that the two documents, in a sense, become mirror images of each other. Uh, if you can think of something like an hourglass, uh, which is wide at the top and wide at the bottom and very narrow in the middle. That's sort of the way it lays out. You've got the beginning and the end parallel each other, either by way of synonymous content or possibly antithetical content. But in any event, they're connected. And then as you march toward the center, you find a series of additional parallels so that uh, it kind of works toward the middle. And at the middle, you have this critical juncture where the real point is communicated. This is very common in the Old Testament. So a lot of uh, chiastic arrangements of material in the Old Testament. To the New T in the New Testament also you'll find it, but uh, some scholars have said that seems to be actually in Luke's mind to some degree or other as he puts this two-volume work together. He starts with Jesus in the, as it were, hinterland. He's in Galilee. Uh, it was actually commonly called Galilee of the Gentiles. It was so far distant from Jerusalem, it was virtually regarded as Gentile land, you know. And you find Luke incorporating there various descriptions of Jesus more or less at the fringes, uh, at the beginning of his life and at the beginning of his ministry and so on. And then in about chapter 10, uh, there's a critical change and Jesus at that point heads toward Jerusalem. And the entire narrative continues to document how the closer get Jesus gets to Jerusalem, the more hostility he encounters. But like a heat-seeking missile, you see, he's just driven, he's just compelled to go to Jerusalem. And so regardless of the rising intensity of resistance and antipathy and hostility and so on, threats, Jesus will not be deterred. He goes right to the heart of the city and there fights a battle. And he wins this battle. It's a cosmic battle. It's a cosmic victory. And so then you get the very end event in Luke, which becomes the very first event in Acts. That's the one point where they overlap, and that's that critical turning point in the chiasm between Luke and Acts. So what is it? Do you know, what's the, what's the one incident that is recorded by Luke, the very last thing he records, and the very first thing that's recorded in the book of Acts? Anybody know off the top of your head what it would be? Please. The Ascension, A+, plus. very good. The Ascension. And of course, for Luke, the Ascension is crucially important because it, it doesn't simply mean Jesus departs, you know, ascends into heaven in that sense, but that's the point where he announces to his disciples, in effect, I won. I fought the battle, and I left the battleground victorious. All authority is given unto me, I've qualified myself to be the king, not the regional king, not the king of Israel, but the cosmic king. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, you see. He gives marching orders, and then he ascends to his throne, and at that point is coronated king of kings and lord of lords. That's the New Testament view. Christ is the king. John says he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. Well, Luke has that in mind when he tells us as the culminating moment of the gospel of Luke that Jesus ascends, and he begins on that same point as he starts Acts. Jesus ascends. And then, of course, from that point on, you've got the back half of the chiasm. Jesus started with the Gentiles and headed to Jerusalem, 
The church starts in Jerusalem facing hostility and heads for the Gentiles, you see. So Jesus starts on the outside and moves to the center. The church begins at the center and is driven to the outside. The book of Luke is in two broad sections. The first section, roughly the first nine chapters, is Jesus on the outside. The second section is Jesus heading to and being in Jerusalem. Acts is in two great sections, the church in Jerusalem and in its environs, and then going to the world. Acts is organized around Peter first, the Gentile, as it were, to the Jews, to Jerusalem, and then Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And then you have finally, the last thing Luke notes at the end of Acts, is Paul at the very, uh, as it were, most remote place from the Jewish point of view, which also happens to be the center of the universe from the Gentile point of view, Rome, you know. So it's very neatly packaged, and it seems that Luke does have something of that uh, going on as he arranges his material here. So we'll refer to that from time to time as we uh, proceed. Who wrote this book? Well, it seems to be a guy named Luke, doesn't it? It's a Greek name, Luke. If we can do that. Luke. Some have said that he was Jewish but simply had a Greek name, such as Paul, who was named Shaul, Saul, at his birth, but went by the name Paulos in the Gentile world. And some have thought that maybe Luke himself was actually Jewish. I think the weight of opinion, however, would go in the opposite direction, that uh, uh, Luke was probably Gentile, and that makes him, as far as we know, the only Gentile author in the New Testament. Uh, interestingly, of course, Luke never personally identifies himself in his writings. He never says, hi everybody, I'm Luke, and I'm writing this work. Paul does, you know, if he says, Paul, an apostle, Paulos, doulos Christu Jesu, he starts right off giving us his identity, and so that's right up front in Paul's writing. Luke doesn't do that, not in Luke, not in Acts. He never mentions himself once. And so we don't have anything in the text of Luke or in the text of Acts in and of itself to tell us definitively that the author is Luke. However, uh, the church ascribed these works to Luke very, very early. So as far back as we can see in church history, it was universally regarded as a writing by Luke. And so we're going to take that at face value. We're not going to question that, although many critics do, and that's a debate I don't want to get into, but uh, nevertheless, we'll just take it for granted that the author of this book is a guy by the name of Luke. Now, we know in the New Testament there is a character whose name is Luke. He's mentioned three times, all three times, by the Apostle Paul. One of those is in his letter to the Colossians, which Paul wrote in about the year 61 when he was in prison in Rome. And at that point, he refers to Luke, the beloved physician. And so that has led the church commonly to view Luke as a doctor, a physician, the ancient equivalent of a medical doctor, you see. And so that's, and again, there's pretty good reason to think that probably is the case. So that's one reference to Luke. Another is in the companion epistle to Colossians, which is called Philemon, which Paul also sent to the church at Colossae and to a character that was there, whose name was Philemon, about a runaway slave. You probably know that story. And Paul makes reference to Luke in that text. And then the other reference to Luke that we find in the New Testament is in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is, as far as we know, the last thing Paul wrote. He's in prison in Rome, but now he's in more unhappy circumstances. This is probably his second imprisonment. It's probably around the year 65, maybe 66. And it appears that his execution is probably just months away. So Paul is in very unhappy circumstances at this point, something probably like a dungeon or some such thing. But in any event, it's not the comfortable imprisonment he had earlier under house arrest which was in the early 60s. This is the second incarceration now when things aren't so pleasant. With a note of pathos, in that text, he makes this reference. He says, everybody has left me except Luke. <laughs> you see, uh, 
So Paul, now at the end of his rope, seems to have been abandoned. Now, I don't mean abandoned necessarily. The people just abandoned him in that sense. But they, they were involved in other things. They were off doing God's work in other places. But the one guy who was standing with him, the one fellow who was there by his side, through thick and thin, had been his traveling companion apparently all through the years, was Luke. And so Paul makes special reference to him uh, right there. So we, we, we infer some things from that. In the book of Acts, uh, we find that there's a reference frequently to we. We went here, we went there. And it's commonly been understood that that is Luke referring obliquely to himself as one of Paul's traveling companions. And so the impression we get is that this was a man who was a professional who had traveled with Paul through the years, certainly probably had you know, departed from time to time for various reasons, but by and large had been there with Paul uh, through the years and now even at the end of Paul's life is right there with him, even possibly providing some kind of health care to him uh, as he's nearing the uh, end of his life, etc. Uh, that seems to be the guy. So I'm going to assume that. I'm not going to make that apology anymore. I'm just going to, from this point on, say Luke, and you'll all know that I'm referring to Luke in the New Testament. However, in the spirit of fairness, let me point out that there have been those who have questioned that deeply and written all kinds of, uh, you know, sort of scholarly attempts and so on to dispute that Luke wrote this and to put it much later, you know, in a later time. I think that's an interesting debate and certainly it's worth looking at, but I don't want to labor you know, burden you with it at this point, so we're just going to make that assumption. Stylistically, Luke is written in a, uh, a rather distinct um, kind of uh, literary um, sort of uh, complexion that you don't find elsewhere so much in the New Testament. The New Testament is written generally in what's called Koine Greek, the coinage. It's the street Greek. It's the marketplace Greek. It's not a holy language. It's a language that was even a little bit on the vulgar side. It was a, uh, it was a language that had deteriorated some over the years as it had been exported from Greece to the world through the period of Hellenism. This became the lingua franca, as they say, only it was the lingua greca, you know, it was, it was the common language of the world. But the fact that many different people had learned it as a second language made it a kind of stripped-down, simplified language. And that was the language in which Paul wrote and the other New Testament authors. But you find in Luke an attempt, at least, to reach back to that more classical style. Now, he's not, it's not classical Greek, such as you'd find in Aristotle, for example, but, but it, is, uh, it does have the memory of classical Greek going on. And Paul uses, or I'm sorry, Luke uses certain spellings certain grammatical constructions and so on that are really distinct. And it, make, it makes uh, Luke's writing uh, have a kind of polish to it. Uh, Jerome, who translated the New Testament into Latin uh, in about the fourth century, said, Luke is the most polished Greek uh, in the Bible, in, in the New Testament. Uh, and it's written by a person who is obviously a person of some you know, uh, robust uh, education. He does write as if he's a professional. Uh, he has a kind of, uh, uh, maybe I'll put it this way, he writes in what we might call the King's English. You know, it's just very proper, very proper, uh, and very respectful. Uh, and I think you know what I'm saying by that. It has that kind of, kind of, you know, polish to it. Paul doesn't write that way. Paul is not above, above vulgarisms in his writing. He can be very earthy, very kind of street-oriented. Not Luke. Luke is very polite, very respectful. So the only other New Testament document that comes close would be Hebrews. Uh, and Hebrews and Luke's writing, Luke and Acts, uh, both have that kind of elevated sort of polished to them. In fact, some people have argued on that basis that maybe Luke wrote Hebrews. I think the weight of evidence is against that, but that just argues that you see that kind of similarity between them. Luke will at times correct the grammar that he finds in some of his sources. So, for example, it seems that he's using Mark. He seems to have a copy of Mark in front of him, and at least at times incorporates, sometimes wholesale, you know, texts from Mark and puts them in his writing. But if Mark makes a grammatical error, Luke fixes it. You know, he does that. It's, uh, 
Uh, Mark writes in a kind of sloppy Greek. Uh, he's fast moving, it's action, it's well, lots of stuff going on, you know, color, flight, sights and sounds and so on. But Luke is a little bit more, you know, careful and, and he corrects uh, Mark at certain points uh, in that way. So anyway, it's, uh, it's interesting to see that sort of thing. All right, uh, when did uh, Luke write? Uh, again, of course, the answers are all over the board here, but I think it seems that the best understanding would be that the way this happened would be something like this. That Luke was a traveling companion of Paul all through the years, that uh, as such he, of course, had opportunity to meet many people who had not only been acquainted with Christ, but who had been some of those, that family of, uh, of characters that play in and out of the drama related to Christ as well as the birth of the church and so on. It seems likely that probably Luke interviewed some of those people, talked to them, uh, and probably took notes. You know, he's a professional guy, and he wrote down in a professional way some of his uh, research findings and so on. And, uh, it, but it doesn't seem as if he was working on these documents, uh, you know, in the process of traveling with others. It's probably more just a matter of gathering information, memoranda, memo to file kind of thing, talk to the Virgin Mary, you know, sort of, you know, that kind of thing is going on. Uh, he's with uh, Paul right to the end. And that's a very tumultuous time uh, in the entire known world. 66 AD, when Paul was probably executed, was also the year that the Jewish wars broke out. And so Jerusalem and Judea generally were, were the target of a great deal of military activity under Vespasian, who's putting down this revolt. It culminates in the destruction of Jerusalem itself under Titus in 70 AD. So for the Jewish world, this was a time of unbelievable upheaval, not only in Jerusalem and its surroundings, but throughout the Jewish world. This was a huge uh, kind of negative moment in the history of Israel to have your homeland just wiped out, you know, devastated. Absolutely vast fortunes were lost in a heartbeat uh, as that city fell. Uh, it's probably what Revelation's talking about when it says the merchants of the earth wept when they saw the smoke rising from her. There, you know, there was a lot of that going on. Uh, but the, Jew, the uh, Roman world was also in a state of huge upheaval. Uh, Nero was ruling and he was having a meltdown and finally had to commit forced suicide in 68. Uh, then you've got the year of four emperors. Everything's falling apart at the seams, you know, and so it seemed that not only in Jerusalem but throughout the Roman world, everything was just kind of going up in chaos. And then, in the fall of 70, it all quiets down. The war in, in Judea is over. Vespasian is on the throne. He's a very sober and uh, stable leader for the first time in some time. And, all, and, and it seems that all's quiet on the Western Front, even for the Christians. That all of a sudden, there's peace. You know, uh, for the rest of really that Christian generation, that it was just peaceful. Now, by the time you get to the end of the first century, you start getting some fireworks again under Domitian. And, uh, do, uh, yeah, Domitian. But uh, for about 20 years, 20 to 30 years, it's very quiet. And it does seem that's most likely the time when Luke now, with a certain degree of experience and leisure, probably in the later years here, has an opportunity to sit down and write this document. And so we're going to put the date for Luke and Acts probably in the late 70s, early 80s. That's been a traditional view uh, in church history, and I'm going to assume that for our purposes. So that's probably when it was written. And thus the point is it's written after the fact. It's written after all these great events had happened, when Luke can now reflect on them and write uh, this uh, document in this way. Who's he writing to? Well, uh, he's writing, it seems, uh, in the first instance, to Gentiles. He is a Gentile, and he has some interest, of course, in making the Christian gospel accessible to a Gentile audience. Uh, he does a lot of things that make it clear that he's trying to make the content of the Christian message understandable and comprehensible to those who were not necessarily steeped in Judaism. He'll sometimes restate things 
in order to make something more understandable. One of the most famous examples of that would be when, when uh, Luke tells the Olivet Discourse. Uh, you recall Jesus describing the events related to Jerusalem's destruction in advance and so on. He gives a warning statement to his followers. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation flee to the mountains. You know. Now, if you're a Jewish reader, you know what that is. You know the abomination of desolation is a reference in Daniel to an event that took place about the year 168 BC in which Antiochus IV slaughtered, defiling the temple, slaughtered some unclean animals there. And that was anticipated by Daniel and took place under Antiochus, and it was a very, very uh, famous, uh, kind of notorious, infamous event of Jewish history. So if you're a Jewish reader and you read Abomination of Desolation, you don't think for a nanosecond, oh, what did that mean? You know what it means, you see. You're, you're right up to speed. But Gentile readers, they don't know that. Abomination of Desolation, what in the world is that? You know? And so Luke very nicely renders it comprehensible for a Gentile. And instead of putting in abomination of desolation, Luke says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, flee to the hills. Oh, well, that makes sense. I can understand Jerusalem surrounded by armies, but abomination of desolation, what in the world is that? You see, and that's the kind of thing, Luke does that again and again, where he'll take sources that were intended for a Jewish audience, and he'll just fix them a little bit. This is not dishonest, it's just taking an idea and making it more comprehensible to those whose culture didn't acquaint them as much, you know, as the original readers with a particular reference and so on. So we like Luke for that reason. We like him because in some ways he interprets a little bit of his sources in a way that, you know, makes it uh, helpful for us as well. So uh, Luke is writing to the Gentile world, but more than that, it's not just a general attempt to, you know, say to people, come to Jesus in a, in a general sort of way. He does write, and this has been noted many times, uh, as it were, a kind of apology. He seems to be writing with a particular, uh, I'm going to say, apologetic purpose in mind. By that I mean a defense. He's writing a defense of the Christian message. It seems as if, it, and I don't want to go so far as to say it's like a legal brief, it's not quite that, but it's that sort of thing where he's writing with a particular intention to defend this Christian movement, the life of Christ, the followers of Christ, the church that is now beginning to get traction in the Roman world. Uh, he's trying to communicate to his audience that these people shouldn't be persecuted, they shouldn't be treated with hostility, they should be recognized as something that is positive within the Roman world. So it's not just Gentiles, but I would say uh, more likely he's writing in a sense to you know, those, at least in the first instance, who may be in positions of authority, who could make decisions about how the church should be you know, viewed and how it should be uh, responded to and so on. Now that, that becomes a little bit hypothetical, but nevertheless uh, many have pointed out in, in, in certain, cert, some of the subtle ways that Luke will describe things that he's obviously trying to show that the Roman world shouldn't view the Christian movement as a threat, that there's no insurrection going on here. There's no likelihood there's going to be a revolt among Christians, as there had been a revolt among Jewish people in Judea in 66. That's not going to happen. That's not the agenda. The Christian movement is not, in that sense, any kind of revolutionary impulse at all. In fact, they're going to be your best citizens, is kind of the way. And then he, he goes out of his way to point out Jew, uh, Roman individuals who had been positively helped, you see, by their contact with Christ or by their contact with uh, the Christian church. So that kind of thing is going on. Uh, and uh, again, it, uh, it gives us at least some hint, I would think, about uh, Luke's purposes. Uh, some other little detail things that pop, by the way, uh, just while I'm flipping my page here, I'll make this note in passing. Um, I'm really appreciative that some of you who are in the choir can come to Sunday school. It's very, very encouraging to see you here. And I know, and, and actually we have a little more leisure this year. My plan is, uh, is this fall uh, to start 
right at 9.15 as we did this morning, and be done uh, by no later than 10.15, maybe even a little earlier, maybe around you know, 10 o'clock, 10.05, something like that. My brain operates in 45-minute segments. <laughs> that is how much I can hold, you know? Uh, and so what happens every week is I get 45 minutes of data in there. Right after Sunday school, my wife knows it all downloads. It's gone. And I go to work on next week's Sunday school lesson from scratch. So it's just, you know, that's the way it works. I, don't, I can't get 60 minutes in there, just 45 minutes. That's the way it goes. So uh, we'll, we'll actually have more leisure this year because I'll be able to wrap up at about 10, 10.05, something like that. And I very much expect that's what I'll do. Uh, it'll give us a lot more time for interaction, comments, questions, and so on, which I have always felt uh, was unfortunately not possible in the sanctuary because we had, you know, people beating at the doors and laying the sanctuary under siege trying to, you know, get in and take over. Uh, and so I've always felt a little pressure to, to hurry us on out. But, uh, but here we can do that. If you're, obviously, if you have reasons to leave, you should just feel perfectly free to do that. If you're in the choir or otherwise need to uh, excuse yourself, that'll be a fairly informal time from that point on. But I'm happy to and really want to hang around and, and talk with uh, anyone who's interested in pursuing some of these things further. So I'm saying all of this just to say to you, if you're in the choir, you should have no problems making your call time. And my plan is to be done by probably this morning about 10 after, something like that. All right. Uh, some other little sub-themes that pop up uh, in Luke that are interesting, and this is both Luke and Acts now, this, this covers both of these works. Uh, peculiar areas where Luke seems especially interested. One of these is references to the Holy Spirit. Obviously, throughout the New Testament, we have references to the Holy Spirit, but for Luke, it has a, a slightly different uh, uh, sort of kind of angle to it. And the problem we have as we read the New Testament is we read the words Holy Spirit, you know, and we immediately think in Trinitarian terms, which is fine. Uh, third person of the Trinity, etc. You know, that's the way we think, and it's okay because that is, I think, Orthodox Christianity, and it's right for us to do that. But at the same time, we should bear in mind that Luke, writing now in about 75 to 80, is writing well before Nicaea, well before the doctrine of the Trinity has been defined, and he's using the term the Holy Spirit, maybe uh, not denying a Trinitarian understanding, but with a slightly different emphasis in view. And that would be this. In the Old Testament, you have repeated references to what is called in Hebrew the Ruach Yahweh, the Spirit of the Lord. It's a very important component of the Old Testament history. And the Ruach Yahweh, the Spirit of the Lord, will show up typically as a means of specially endowing people with supernatural power. So you'll hear that the Spirit of the Lord came on Samson, you know, when he killed a thousand Philistines, or the Spirit of the Lord came on Moses, or this person, or that person. You read that kind of language, and typically that reference to the Spirit of the Lord is simply a way in the Hebrew mindset of saying the special presence of God coming into a person's life to equip them to do something that would be far beyond anything they could do with their own talent or ability. All right. Now that seems to be the sense in which Luke refers to the Spirit of God. And so, you know, aside from the Trinitarian aspect, the thing we need to keep in mind is how frequently Luke wants to confirm that the work that we see in Christ and the work that we see in the church is continuous with the work of God's Spirit in the Old Testament. That the Spirit that comes on Christ at his baptism is the Spirit of the Lord, you know. And that Christ is specially equipped and anointed to be the Messiah and to do the things that he does because of this unique capacity that he's received by virtue of the Ruach Yahweh. It seems as if Luke wants to keep that before us. And then most interestingly, he continues that kind of uh, description when we get to Acts. It's the Spirit of the Lord that comes on the people in Jerusalem. And they begin speaking in tongues and prophesying and doing all of these things that are supernatural in character. It's the Spirit of the Lord, you see, who comes along and gives the church this ability to be something greater than it could be just based on its own human resources. 
Luke's message, at least in part, is that my friends this morning, we gathered here in God's house as part of God's church, are the recipients of the Spirit of the Lord. And that we have that same kind of power to do something we couldn't do on our own, namely be witnesses to Christ in a way that can change the very course of history. So Luke wants us to understand that, that that remarkable power that we saw in the Old Testament is now being poured out on his people, first of all in Christ, and secondly on the followers of Christ, his disciples, and eventually, you see, to all of us, that we are all recipients of that. So that's a theme we'll see popping up uh, repeatedly in his writing. Another theme that shows up is Luke's interest in prayer. Many commentators have noted this. Many times, Luke will tell the same story as somebody else, but he'll include a little reference to prayer. You can almost miss it, because many times it's just kind of in passing. But, for example, the baptism of Jesus. Matthew and Mark say, Jesus was baptized, and as he came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and the Spirit of the Lord descended upon him, you know, and so on. Luke says, Jesus was baptized, came up out of the water, and as he was in prayer, the, the heavens opened and the Spirit descended. You see, just that little additional point. Uh, again and again, you find Luke incorporating that. Luke is all about prayer. Now, I'm going to just tell you, I've told you this before, if you've been in my class, I'm, I'm not good at prayer. <laughs> you know, I've, and, uh, yeah, that's right. I've, it hasn't improved over the summer. But, uh, but uh, so Luke is going to be good for me. I don't know about you. You're probably all wonderful in this dis discipline, but uh, I still have a lot to learn. But we're going to be reminded of prayer again and again. You see, as we work our way through Luke, we're going to see him constantly referring back to that uh, great aspect of Christian practice. Luke is especially interested in women. That's been frequently noted. Uh, he will go out of his way. I think he was an OBGYN, actually. I think, he, I think that was his, you know, interest professionally. Uh, but he really has a high respect and a high regard for women. Uh, and many times when other New Testament uh, commentators will kind of plow right through an account and just refer to the men, Luke includes the women who were there and makes it very clear, uh, you know, how important and strategic they were uh, in the life of Christ and, and very much in the life of the church. Uh, and so even in Acts, especially in Acts, you find again and again these references to the prominent uh, and conspicuous role that women played in the early uh, years of the church. He makes, uh, uh, it's been many times noted that Luke is the uh, New Testament author who is especially interested in what I'm going to call social justice. It's when you and me, I don't like that term very much uh, for reasons I won't bother you with right now, but, but you know what I mean by that. He's interested in the poor. He's interested in those who are marginalized in a variety of ways. And he goes out of his way to acknowledge the importance of such people as, the, as part of the conscious concern of Christian uh, ministry. Uh, you, uh, you see this again and again, of course, in, in uh, well, just an example that's well known to you, in the Beatitudes. You know, Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Luke says, blessed are the poor, you know, just that in itself, that little, uh, little adjustment now, I don't think they're saying two different things. We'll talk about that when we get to that text. But uh, nevertheless, it's just a slightly different emphasis there that Luke wants to keep before us, the importance of, uh, of the poor. He's also interested in wealth, and he has, has a whole lot to say about the stewardship of wealth. He has uh, plenty to say about the humanity of Christ. This is probably one of the best-known aspects of Luke's uh, writing. Matthew is usually regarded as highlighting Christ as king, symbolized by the lion. Mark uh, s uh, sort of highlights Christ as servant, symbolized by the ox. Luke, Christ as man. Christ as human, symbolized by the face of a man. 
John, of course, Christ is deity, symbolized by the flying eagle. Those are the classic symbols that have been used to describe the four gospels, the four evangelists. But that's, there's really some truth to it. We see the human Jesus uh, throughout Luke. We see Jesus moved with compassion. We see the touch. We see, some, we see aspects of Christ and his humanity that aren't quite so obvious in other uh, accounts. So anyway, all of that. Let's, uh, with that lengthy uh, kind of uh, introduction, let's come to the text now briefly, and I'll uh, take a look at some of the details here. So if you uh, have the uh, text in front of you, just a few uh, things here in this first short paragraph. Luke says, uh, since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us. A couple of details. First of all, many. The very fact that Luke says already many had undertaken to set down accounts of the life of Christ and so on suggests that he's writing later rather than earlier. He seems to have these sources available to him. He's not writing disparagingly about them. He's not saying, and they all messed it up, and so now I'm going to set the record straight. It's not that kind of idea at all. He's not trying to correct, you see, what he thinks are manifest errors out there. But he is acknowledging that there have been others that have gone before that have already taken up this effort uh, to write down some kind of account. Obviously, some of those accounts we have in the New Testament. We have Matthew, we have Mark. We don't know exactly when Matthew was written, but it may be that it was before Luke, uh, maybe about the same time. But in any event, uh, there were other accounts that were you know, obviously not part of the canon of the New Testament. We, many of those we may not even be familiar with. But uh, we have these uh, accounts that have been written. And so Luke says now he wants to, re he, he refers to the events that have been fulfilled among us. And the grammar there, the, the grammatical construction suggests that he's talking about events that have now been completed. In other words, they've been brought to a fulfillment. They're there, it's not, in other words, it's not something in process, uh, which again suggests Luke is writing later. This would imply, insofar as that seems to be a reference to the entire work, that he's writing after even the events referred to in Acts. Uh, these things have all been completed. They've all been fulfilled. And so he views the life of Christ and the birth of the church as kind of decisive events, history-changing events, and it's never going to be the same again. This divine intrusion has changed everything. Uh, Luke wouldn't be surprised to find out that 2,000 years later, people like us are sitting here, and we're sitting in the year, what, 2008, Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. We're still marking our calendars. Now, I realize there's a very concerted effort these days to get rid of Anno Domini, and replace it with what? C-E, right? Common era. I say, so what? What is it in history that shifted us from B-C-E to C-E? What was that, you know? That wasn't Cyrus the Great. That wasn't Julius Caesar. That was Jesus of Nazareth that so affected human history that we call everything since then the common era, right? Well, what made it so common? What was it that made equivalence around this world? What is it that broke down all of the old st structures and made something new, you see? It was Jesus of Nazareth, friends, you know. And so whatever you call it, I mean, I'm not apologizing for using A.D., but uh, regardless of how we designate it, Luke wouldn't be surprised to hear it. These are the things that have been fulfilled. And the very way he words that implies that he views the things he's going to tell us as those things which have conditioned all history and all subsequent history will be uh, conditioned by these great events. He goes on and says, uh, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So Luke now refers to those he calls eyewitnesses. This is another very interesting aspect of the New Testament case. It frequently refers its uh, verification, as it were, back to eyewitness testimony. Uh, this is not mythology. The New Testament doesn't purport to give us events that took place in secret. Christianity is not a mystery religion, as was so common in the ancient world. Jesus was a public man. He spoke publicly. 
He conducted his ministry of healing and so on publicly. He was in plain view by both friends and enemies. He was right out there in the sunshine, in the open. The Christian church began as a public institution. It was in the streets of Jerusalem. It wasn't some private little uh, hiding place, a closet somewhere. The Christian faith has always viewed itself, and the Christian movement has always maintained that it is right out in the open. You notice in Christian churches, we don't have secret sanctuaries. Some religions do, as you know. Secret places where only the elite can enter, and the rest of us can't go in there. We don't have that. You can walk into any room in this church, you see. There's no, there's no restriction at that point, because it is that kind of public atmosphere. And the New Testament use of the word eyewitness is indeed in some ways an attempt to get that over to us. This is eyewitness testimony. The Apostle Paul writing in about the year 56 says of the resurrection of Christ that he rose again from the dead on the third day and that he was seen first by Peter, then by the twelve, then by more than 500 most of whom are still alive at this time, Paul says. Now, virtually everybody grants that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. See, even critical scholars who hate to admit it have finally been forced to grant Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. So here you've got a document that in fact was written about the year 56 AD that makes passing reference to a host of eyewitnesses. And Paul is as much as saying, look, if you don't believe me, go ask them. After you've talked to about 50 or 60 people, all of whom are telling you, yeah, I saw him rise from the dead too. I mean, how many times do you have to hear that before you start going, you know, maybe he did rise from the dead. Maybe that really did happen in history. Maybe this isn't just mythology or legend or inflated hyperbole or some such thing. Because all these people saw it. You know, how did that happen exactly? And this, uh, in, in, you know, I, when I was practicing law, I always liked... If, uh, if I had an auto accident situation, if I could bring in an eyewitness, you know, that's the best kind of evidence. Now, eyewitnesses can be wrong. But if I could bring in 50 people who all told basically the same story about the auto accident, I was in pretty safe ground there. You know, I was in pretty, because eyewitness testimony is direct testimony. And the New Testament tells us that eyewitnesses, many of them, saw these events. And that that is, in fact, at least from a historical, empirical point of view, part of what gives us confidence. Obviously, there's more than that. We're not simply believing based on historical argument. But the fact that what we believe is compatible with what history otherwise attests to should give us confidence that we're not just believing a pipe dream, that we're not just in a mass hallucination here, you know, with respect to... The, uh, the references to Christ. So anyway, it's, I, and, and this reference to eyewitnesses, of course, is, is common in the New Testament, but Luke here uh, makes his own reference to it. He continues, uh, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So Paul, or, uh, Luke is indicating that he's investigated everything. That word implies personal investigation, interviews, that kind of thing, not simply relying on other written documents, but actually doing his own independent research. Uh, so I assume that that is what Luke did. He uh, wants to write an orderly account. The word orderly does not necessarily mean chronological. Uh, we, in, in modern historical and historiographical kinds of uh, disciplines, we tend to think, you know, you need to write chronologically, and in the ancient world it just wasn't quite so important. Uh, so we're not holding Luke to strict chronology. None of the New Testament authors necessarily do that. They organize their material thematically, and Luke does something of that as well. But at least in broad terms, he is chronological. He certainly has the birth of Christ before the death of Christ. I mean, there's a basic chronology going on, but in some of the details, he, uses some ex he exercises some uh, liberties there, and we'll let him do that. He refers to Theophilus. Theophilus is a common name. It means theos, phileo, uh, lover of God. Some have thought, well, maybe this is symbolic. Maybe Luke is writing to a kind of symbolic, you know, uh, lovers of God sort of thing. Probably not. Probably it's a real human being. Some have thought maybe this is the patron, the guy who financed the project. 
gave Luke the time off, you know, to write this. That's possible. But the, the phrase here that's interesting is he uses that phrase, most excellent <laughs> Theophilus. That particular construction tended to be reserved for people who were in positions of governmental authority. It'd be like calling someone your excellency, you see. It doesn't imply that Theophilus was a good buddy of Luke's. Somebody, you know, that they hung out at the Starbucks or something. It, it, it really sounds more like this is something written for a person who is going to adjudicate a case, a judge or some other kind of public officer. Your Excellency, let me respectfully present to you our case on behalf of, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, now, that's speculation. We don't know for sure, but nevertheless, uh, that would at least be the facial impression that you get from the language here. And then finally, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed, or the word could also be informed. So you may know the truth of the things about which you've been informed. I am presenting to you now, you see, the statement of facts. When I wrote legal briefs, we'd always have a statement of facts, you know, and it was many times based on sworn testimony. And that's sort of the spirit of what Luke is doing here. I'm going to give you our statement of facts. Here is the case in terms of a history of these events that have been described. I want you to know, he says, the truth of them. What he means by that is the historical truth of them. Not simply the philosophical truth, uh, you know, the truth in terms of platitude, uh, but the actual truth of it as a matter of, of history. I'm going to leave you with this, uh, a couple of quotes here. Uh, it, it, it has been impressed me again, I guess, as I've been doing some thinking about this over the summer, how strategic it is, important it is, that we as Christians understand that our um, commitments, our Christian faith, is rooted in actual space-time history. Uh, this is not just a kind of interesting stories that are inspiring, you know, uh, devotional fiction. Uh, that the validity of our faith is, is really tied inseparably to the historicity of these events that we uh, believe. C.H. Uh, Dodd, who was by no means a Bible-banging fundamentalist, uh, nevertheless had the following to say, uh, great New Testament scholar if you don't know his name, uh, some religions can be indifferent to historical fact and more entirely upon the plane of timeless truth, Christianity cannot. It rests upon the affirmation that a series of events happened in which God revealed himself in action for the salvation of men. The Christian faith is rooted in the idea that a series of events happened, you know. And uh, another statement, I'll finish with this, by G. Kittle. Kittle is the uh, guy who put together Kittle's theological work, word book of the New Testament, probably the most formidable uh, scholarly attempt to uh, define the words used in the New Testament. He's an eminent scholar, uh, and he writes as follows, uh, quote, the, the Jesus of history is valueless and unintelligible unless he be experienced and confessed by faith as the living Christ. But it would be, uh, it would be, if we would be true to the New Testament, we must at once reverse this judgment. The Christ of faith has no existence, is mere noise and smoke, apart from the reality of the Jesus of history. These two are utterly inseparable in the New Testament. They cannot even be thought of apart. No word about Christ is not referred to except as him who suffered under Pontius Pilate, and which is not at the same time intended as the gospel applicable to all men of every time and every place. Anyone who attempts first to separate the two and then describe only one of them has nothing in common with the New Testament. It's a remarkable statement. If you know anything about new, uh, 20th century theology, you know there was a huge burning attempt to separate the Jesus of history from the Christ of faith. The Jesus seminar is all about that. There's the Jesus of history about whom we know virtually nothing, and there's the Christ of faith. Well, who is the Christ of faith? if not somehow connected to the Jesus of history. That's, that's the...